Hi, it's Pat again here at SideShift. I'm here today to talk about batteries. We get a lot of inquiries about batteries and, and what kind of battery, what size of battery, all the different questions around batteries. And I thought, why not go to the experts to get that answer? So today I'm here in Canada at Total Battery and I have Dave with me today. Dave, How's thanks going? very much for, uh, for coming out here today and, and giving us your insight into some of these batteries. Yeah, no problem, glad to be here. The biggest, I guess the first thing I'd like to start with, What's the difference between sealed lead acid, AGMs, lithium ion phosphate? Like, what seems to be the, what's the, what's the controlling factor in there? Uh, lead acid is basically your, your main conventional battery that you see pretty much every day in every vehicle. Uh, most marine batteries also lead acid. Uh, once you get into the AGM, which is your premium version, which is just a sealed version of a late, uh, lead acid, all the liquid that's in a conventional lead acid would be absorbed into the glass mat separators, which cause it to be leak proof and puncture proof. Um, more density, more cranking power, more reserve capacity, which allows for better performance and higher price range. Yeah, I noticed when, when we're out by, I mean, certainly, certainly the Odyssey here is a very good uh, AGM battery, but there is quite a price difference. So I guess, um, from my knowledge from the past, I guess they, they will last longer. Is that correct? Or is yeah, if maintained properly, they will last longer. They also have a longer warranty, which is why the price is more significant than their regular ones. Okay. Okay, and of course AGM being a better battery for down inside the cabin areas, uh, being being a, a, a glass mat battery. These can also be put on their side, can they not? Yes, they can, uh, because there's no fluid in it. If it's put on the side, nothing will spill out, so you have no worry about anything contaminating your boat. So, so sometimes in those tight spots when they have to lay the battery down, they can just lay it down. Um, I know I did that on, on, on a boat myself, and, uh, and, I, and that's how I found that out. They are a lot heavier, so putting it down in that little cubby hole can be a challenge sometimes. Yes, yes, they are. <laughs> Unless you go to lithium, which would be a lot lighter, like probably 50% lighter than most of your conventional batteries. And you know what? I've been getting a lot of questions about lithium batteries. They're saying, can I use a lithium battery in, in, this, in this application? Of course, you know that in our application, we're using an 850 CCA battery for, for, uh, for the, the power that we need to run our system. Now, can we get that in a lithium in a lithium battery? There are lithiums that do have that cranking power capabilities, yeah. um, but they're specifically designed for that, as most lithium batteries will have a battery management system in it, which controls the load that's coming in and out of it. So depending on the load that's from your thrusters, it'll more likely trip the battery management system and cause it to look like it's failed. Okay. Yeah, because our, see, our 340 system will draw 500 amps on initial hit and then drop down to like 340, 350 amps. So. Yeah, so for this battery, which is 100 amp hours, it's maximum is 100 amps. Okay, okay. So, so they, they, we, you can buy a specific lithium battery because a lot of guys are going, man, that's a lot of weight I'm pounding and I'm putting down in the front of my boat. You know, can I get something lighter? And of course, that's why the question is coming up about lithium batteries. Yeah, um, so this brand specifically has three different options when it comes to the starting deep pur uh, dual purpose situations for starting both thrusters and running all your electronics in the boat. Okay, okay. You just mentioned something that, that's fascinating because we get a lot of questions about it as well. We, I get guys calling me up saying, I can find an AGM, but it's a, it's a combination battery. It's, it's got amp hours and it's got, you know, 1,000 CCA. Uh, you know, in most cases, I don't, tell a peop I don't tell them that they can't use it. Are they, are they getting the bang for their buck as far as the cranking capability? So if you're looking for a straight cranking battery, it's gonna be a starting battery, which is the cold cranking amp CCA or cranking amps CA. Those ones will more likely just have one terminal on them and only produce straight cranking power for starting engines or massive power draws at one initial setting. Reserve capacity or amp hours is your actual discharging capacity, which is when you want to hook up a light or a monitor to run your fish finder and all that stuff. That will be hooked up differently and discharged at a prolonged period of time at an initial rate. The difference inside the batteries between the two of them is thinner plates, thicker plates, more power, less power based on those situations. So for all intentional purposes for our application, if they get a combination battery that, that has a minimum of 850 CCA, but it does have an amp hour, it will work in our application yes. when it's hooked up that way. Yeah, oh, it just, depending on how long you want to run it for without cranking it, that could cause an, uh, an issue once you do want to turn it over again. Yeah. The yeah, these, see our systems running, our system typically run five to 10 seconds and then there's a short break, then five to 10 seconds short break. Oh. And they might do this for, you know, a couple of minutes docking their boat. 
So the, the application, the, 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 the 850 CCA or the 1700 amps for our bigger system works very well for that. Yeah. So the, the, the combination battery will do that for Definitely, you. Definitely, yeah. Okay. The other thing I guess that people and myself included, um, we got all these sizes. Like I always recommend the 31 series, which is here. We've got the 27 series, which is here. And of course, over by yourself, we got the 24 series. What, what's the difference? Is it, is it just strictly um, um, you know, volume, like p places to put it, or is there an actual difference? Well, realistically, the smaller the battery, the less cranking power and or capacity that that battery can have because the battery is only so big inside. So depending on what you want to run or do with that battery, a different size would be more compatible with your unit. So smaller battery, less cranking power, less amp hours, and you keep going up to what you need. So it really depends on your usage and what you want to run for how long. Okay, so the 31 series that we've been using is probably the main is, is the main battery for us because we're going to be, you know, when you're docking a boat, you could take, you know, five, ten minutes of docking a boat and you're using the thruster on and off on different, you know, different times to bring the boat in, push the boat off, whatever you're going to do to do that. So by having the 31 series, I guess we've got the volume yeah. that will last a little bit longer as opposed to the 24 series. Exactly. There's more cranking power in that one larger battery than these two combined. So even though they both say 850 CCA. Yep. Okay. So the other, the other questions we're getting, um, and of course it's not really relevant to us, but I thought we'll take the time to talk about it a little bit. The difference between a cranking battery and a deep cycle battery, because deep cycle batteries will not work on our application. No, I mean, realistically, a cranking battery is mainly just for starting. So starting an engine or using your thrusters, yeah. initial high current draw for a small amount of time. Whereas discharging deep cycle batteries, you're running an application for X amount of time for a prolonged period of time. And that's what this one, these ones do. So you want to run on something, it's a deep cycle battery. If you want to power something up for an initial 5, 10, 15 seconds, like a starting engine or a thruster, you want a cranking battery. Okay. Now, I, I, know, I know from past experience, people have called us or we've noticed that we've, we've actually damaged uh, a deep cycle battery using it, uh, people using it in our application because of the draw of power. Yeah, I mean, a deep cycle battery or a dual purpose battery will have cranking power and reserve capacity, just like a starting battery, but it's the opposite. Crank, starting batteries will have high cranking, less reserve. A deep cycle battery or dual purpose battery will have less cranking, higher reserve. Okay. So you're not getting that initial cranking power with a deep cycle or dual purpose battery because of your application. Okay, okay. And apparently the, the plates are a little thicker and they're closer together or something, is that correct? Yes, there's less plates and then they're thicker for discharging the batteries yeah. and thinner plates, more of them to provide more cranking power. The other thing we have, when we're talking to customers, customers often, you know, when we're trying to troubleshoot a system, I'll tell them first off, right off the bat, I'll ask them, I'll say, chat, what's your voltage? And they'll say, ah, it's 12.8, you know, or it's 24.6 or 25.7. I understand that's just static. But what's really the difference between static and load? Well, the load is going to be what's drawing the battery down. So if you're measuring your voltage at 12.8 and it's gradually decreasing, that would mean there's a load on it, whether it be small parasitic draw, um, just a small little LCD that needs to be lit up. Yeah. That's, there's always going to be something on it when you're hooked up to a system. There's always some sort of draw on there. When it's by itself and the voltage is whatever it's supposed to be, it should not decrease on its own, at least not for a month. It's about 3 to 15% yeah. uh, self-discharge per month when it's not hooked up. The less that it's charged up, the more it's going to actually decrease. Okay. So it's always good to keep the battery fully charged. Okay. Because I know it's like a lot, of, a lot of times when we're troubleshooting a system, you know, they'll say, well, I got 12.8, and then I'll ask them to actually use the thruster, and that 12.8 will drop down to like 9. Yep. You know, and of course, that's that's an indication either either a failure in charging or possibly a bad cell. Well, normally, whenever you what? start an engine or use the amperage that you're going to draw from the battery, it will drop voltage because okay. you're pulling all that power from that battery. But if once you stop that and you check it again, it dec it uh, increases back to where it's supposed to be. Okay, minus a little bit less because you use the power out of it. So now I just want to, I want to change gears here a little bit. We've talked about batteries and we've talked about the, the various sizes and the lithium versus the AGM versus the lead acid. Now this application, these batteries have to be charged. And in a boat, 
uh, there are several applications. We have the, we have the NOCO here, the NOCO Gen 2, and we have a DC to DC charger for the 24 volt systems. So Dave, what's, how important is it to get the right charger for the application? That's very important actually. You want to make sure your battery is constantly charged up. It's a discharge battery is never a good battery. By maintaining it and keeping it charged up, it's going to last a lot longer and provide you the power that you need once you actually do go ahead and use it. The type of charger you want to get is specifically a smart charger, which is a battery-based charger. It monitors the battery voltage and it charges up accordingly. Also, there is different amperages for the charger, so depending on the size of your battery, you may want to get a higher amperage. Lower amperages are more typically catered to smaller batteries or for storage mode once the battery is sitting for, for long periods of time. It'll just put a float on it at a small amperage. Now, these new chargers, they will also de detect what the battery needs, whether it needs a charge or whether it needs to be uh, descaled. Or do, do they get into doing those as well, these chargers? Yeah, a lot of these chargers will have their own specific stages within the charging algorithm that provides reconditioning or um, desulfation. Uh, those are all part of it. And then once the battery is fully charged, it monitors the battery's voltage. And again, it won't charge it unless it has to and just pulses it every few minutes to check to see if it's dropped and then it'll top it back up. Because I remember years ago, the old, the old chargers would literally boil the battery. Yeah, so those um, ones there are timer-based chargers. They yeah. basically charge for a specific amount of time. And then if you don't unplug it, it'll constantly keep doing that. And then yeah. eventually you have nothing left. But we don't have to worry about that nope, with these new ones. Not at of all. course, this one here happens to be the NOCO. There's also the ProMariner and there's yeah. many other chargers, which as long as they're a smart charger, yeah. is that correct? That's what you okay. want to look for, a smart charger, this processor and the actual charger to monitor the battery. Okay. On our, on our 230 system, we only use a single battery. So I guess we could get away with just a single stage charger. Yep. On our 340 system, which runs two batteries in parallel, is it recommended that we get a, we use a charger with a, with a bank on each battery? Preferably you'd want to charge each battery individually because what happens is one battery starts losing some of its capacity, you're going to charge both these batteries together and you can potentially ruin one battery as it's going to overcharge it because it thinks it's charged and the other one's not. So there's going to be problems there. It's always good to charge them individually or if you buy a two bank charger like this one up here, you can hook up both batteries together and they'll do their thing. You won't even have to worry about it. Exactly. Okay, that's great. Now I noticed in the last few years, I've started to use this, this Victron product and it's a DC to DC charger. Um, a lot of the customers call me up and they go, well, I, you know, the 24 volt systems, which we have, and of course this will work on a 24 volt system, won't it? Yeah. Because when you're, when you're charging each individual battery, it's basically only 12 volts that you're charging. Exactly. It's only when we cross batteries that we get the 24 volts. Correct. So this, this charger will work on a 12 volt system or a 24 volt system. Yeah. yeah, you got two batteries either parallel or series, hook them up to each individual battery, each bank, and the, the charger does its own thing. It'll recognize that it's a one battery and not one giant battery. Right. Oh. And I notice on these chargers too, they, they have a mode button and you can go to a lead acid battery, an AGM battery, or now of course they got the lithium in there. Yeah. Right. Is it important that that setting is set properly? Yes, uh, each setting has its own specific voltage and algorithm for it. So for lead acid batteries, you want to use the lead acid setting. For an AGM sealed version, you'd want to use that setting. And then the lithium one, I would only use that on lithium one just because it's a higher voltage and potentially can ruin the batteries as well. Okay, okay. Now I notice on this one here, it also has a repair on it. What would you, when would you use the repair on it? So after you charge up a battery, maybe once every three to six months, you want to put it on repair mode. It basically just pulses the battery and tries to break up any sulfation that accumulated over time from leaving it discharged, which is a good option to use. Okay, okay. So I've also noticed that on that, I go, well, I guess you put it on when you've got to repair the battery, but <laughs> okay. Hey, the, the Victron, uh, was an interesting find for me. A customer showed this to me because I get a lot of guys with 24 volt systems and they want to charge it like, especially if you're doing the Rito system or you're doing the Grand Loop, you know, you're going through different locks and you're, you know, you don't often get to shore to get plugged in to get one of these guys working. So with, with the DC to DC charger, of course, we can just hook it up to DC voltage and, and it brings it out. So how does that work? Like, how does it take 12 volts and charges 24 volts? It's just isolating the, the 12 volt section, 
of the, uh, the battery and the, uh, the alternator and converting it to 24 for the other bank. It's just taking the two voltages and just isolate them separately and then the unit itself is doing its own thing just like the charger would recognize two batteries hooked up either 12 or 24. Okay so it's all automatically built up inside of that and then they talk about isolated versus non-isolated. So isolated is where it's taking the two frequencies and doing some special scientific stuff that I don't want to get into with you because it's very complex. The non-isolated one is just basically a ground. It's grounded directly to the unit itself. It's probably going to be the least expensive and the most efficient option for you. Okay, so like if, if someone wanted to sort of bring it right from the generator or right from the alternator, I guess it would be a better option to get the isolated as opposed to the non-isolated, which you yeah. can just grab off a battery. Yeah, if a lot of times the isolated one's going to have its own electrical safeties that you need to figure out with the electrician for that aspect. But when it comes to marine, using alternators in the boats, non-isolated should be more than enough. Okay, so I've had a lot of calls. People say, I, I can find batteries, but I can't find batteries with the 3 8 post or the 5 16 post for the threaded post. Don't, don't, get too, don't get too tied up in it. I mean, it's, it's nice. It's the post that you need for our application and for our lugs, but you can buy these adapters and they come in both positive and negative terminal. And all you do is just put that on the terminal, push it down, and now you have your threaded post to put our terminals and to connect your batteries to our system. So it's a nice easy fix. They work on both negative, you, this one here is a negative, and you can see, see that? Goes right onto the battery just like that. You can get a positive, the positive is typically larger. So you can get the positive one to put on the positive as well. Last but not least on the battery, on the battery side of things, Dave, maintenance. What, like, they're sealed, you, you know, like there's no caps anymore to check or, or anything of that nature. Like if, if I was gonna put my system away for the winter, what, what would be the maintenance or what would be, let, let's put it this way. What would be, you know, sort of a summer maintenance versus a winter maintenance? Uh, realistically, not very much. The only difference is in the winter, you'd want to make sure that it's stored in a semi-warm environment. But uh, as for batteries that do have caps, you want to make sure that they're always topped up. Check every six months just to make sure and then just add distilled water to keep them topped up just above the plates. Uh, when you do store them, make sure you charge them up before you put them away. And then every three months, check to see if the voltage has gone down. If it gets around 12.2, it's good to charge it back up. If you have a smart charger, you want to store it, charge it up, let it sit there for the duration of your storage, and then that will be fine. Okay, okay. I know, I know on my boat, um, I have a lot of batteries, and it's right down in the, in the you know, below the, the salon of the boat, and getting batteries in and out of there is not actually a, <laughs> a thing I like to do on a regular basis. So I typically just charge them and make sure they're all fully charged, and I disconnect the negative so that there's no possible draw of current coming off of them, and I leave them there for the winter. Is, is that okay to do that? Yeah, so if you charge them up before you store them, uh, you're gonna leave them in the boat. Sometimes they're hard to get out, like you said. There's not really much you can do about that, but charge them up always, and then hopefully disconnect everything as much as you can so no, there's no draw on it, aside from the battery's own draw. And hopefully by the uh, summer, winter, whenever you bring the boat back out, the, the battery is fully charged. If not, just top it up and then you should be good to go. That's fantastic. Listen, David, th this has been very informative. I, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time today to, to help us out. And, and for those of you in Canada or certainly in Ontario, you know, if you need some questions answered, there's no harm in giving Dave a call here at Total Battery. Yeah. He'd be more than happy to answer your questions. I hope you have a great boating season and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.